oh, 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 oh. Being a man means responsibility, accepting it, leaning into it. I don't know, and, and I think I'm okay with that. Love. Tenacity. Strong. For me, a man means gentleness and it means collaboration. I'm a man. I told my son it's okay to cry. My dad never told me that. How are men navigating this Me Too era? There seem to be new rules of engagement, but no rule book. We live in a time where men are being challenged to look at ourselves and ask some hard questions. But the paradigm has shifted, and where men have been a part of the problem, now we have to step up and be a part of the solution. In this episode, a leading psychotherapist reveals to me what men are really grappling with inside of the Me Too era. We have to have a conversation, but an honest one, and that's what we're gonna do today. I'm Jason Rosario, and this is Dear Men. I was always a ladies' man, I'm not gonna lie. I always had a girl. Some of the reaction of the Me Too movements can to me feel like an attack on men. There is no rules, it's just such a gray area. I was always honest with each, each and one of them. I always said, listen, remember, I'm not your man, I'm gonna always have another lady. You okay with that, I'm okay with it. I learned very quickly in life that a woman has just as much authority as a man. Yeah, I take cues from them. I take cues from their mother. I take cues from the, the women I work with. I don't err on the side of like, you know, signed releases. It's kind of like, are we okay? You know, it's kind of like a physical body language type thing. I'm scared of what the other person might interpret my actions as. You will know, if you're, if you're present and sensitive to that, you will know whether or not to stop or go. I want women to get what they're supposed to get, because I, I, well, trust me, believe me, I want them to get that. But does that stop me from being a man? I think that's the question, and that's where I get stuck. Avi Klein is a psychotherapist based in New York City. He's written in the New York Times about how the Me Too movement is causing men to reevaluate everything. Men are grappling with, at least for the first time in my lifetime and in our lifetime, our toxic behaviors and how we're showing up in, in our personal and professional lives. Mm -hmm. And you do a lot of work with men. Yeah. So I'm curious to hear what men are telling you yeah. that they're not comfortable speaking about in public. I think men are looking at the headlines and looking at the news and seeing parts of themselves in those stories, you know? Men are really trying to make sense of things like consent mm. and when they've pushed uh, the boundaries around that and when they have not been attentive to the women in their lives and their pain and have kind of looked for their, their own pleasure at women's expense. I think that's, that's the thing that stands out to me. What, what's a particular story that stands out for you? Particular story that stands out for me would be this one young man that I worked with who, uh, after working together for a while, kind of tentatively shared with me that there were a few women in his life um, where he had really made things sexual if they weren't sexual, and then years later he's sitting with this uh, guilt. And it's amazing to me because I do have a lot of conversations with men who are taking inventory of, of their lives yeah. and going back to periods where they were unsure. Yeah. And they were like, was this gray? Was this right? Was this wrong? Yeah. What, how, how do you have those conversations with men? I think um, with a lot of empathy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really hard to, to do. And I, I really respect anyone who's doing that self-inventory, so I try to make that clear to people yeah. um, first and foremost. Because I think part of the reason they feel so uncomfortable is the way it's talked about in the culture it's like, you're a monster, you're a horrible person, you hate women, and that's not the that's case. That's not the case, right? And that's what I'm interested in. It's like, how do you make sense of people who, you love women, you love the women in your life, and you've hurt them at the same time. And I think it's probably, it would be a rare man who hasn't, who hasn't done something like that in some way. Yeah. Let's talk about Me Too. Yeah. One of the things that I'd like to see the conversation evolve towards is this concept of restorative justice. Yes. And, and forgiveness. I'm with you. Is that something that's happening? Because I know it's happening behind closed doors with my own friends. I think that that's a framework that is really helpful in my work because I think, yeah, if this is just about what have you done legally and what's the punishment, 
then you're really missing the humanity there. And that's, that's what I think of when I think of restorative justice is how do I make things right between the two of us. And there's nuance in everything, right? It's when you think about the, look, and I'm not making excuses for some of the more egregious behavior, yeah. but what I'm, think, what I'm saying is when you look at case by case, there are things that uh, I think we can explore and understand the nuance before we make an indictment of. Yeah. And we live in a society where, unfortunately, the court of public opinion is less forgiving than the legal system. Yeah. So how does one recover from something like that? I mean, I don't know how, you'd have to ask a PR specialist <laughs> yeah. like how you recover right. your, your reputation, but between people, right, what I've seen is that it's really important when I work with couples and when I work with individuals, it's really important for a person who has harmed someone to feel, you have to feel guilty. It's okay to feel guilty sure. when you've done something wrong. And shame. Yeah. Right, it's the concept yeah, of shame. Exactly. There's good shame and then there's self-destructive shame. Exactly, there's, there's the kind of shame that's like, I'm a bad person, right? And then there's the shame of like, I did something bad and I feel ashamed about that. Mm. And that's good, yeah. you know? It's, we should, only sociopaths don't feel that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you're, you're on the right track if you feel bad about your actions. Absolutely, I, I struggle with shame in my own life thinking about instances in which maybe I haven't lived up to my best standard? Me too. Me too. <laughs> How do you struggle? I mean, what, what's your struggle been like? Uh, you know, it's the beginning of accountability. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think it's okay to, uh, to sit with that. And that's your conscience at work, right? That's telling you what, um, what can I do differently next time? And, and maybe part of that is making amends with the person you hurt. That's a big piece of my work is that men have not learned how to feel their feelings. And so that's kind of like the first step is getting in touch with what, what am I feeling about this stuff? Right. And a lot of that is just kind of gaining awareness. What's, your, what's happening in your body, you know? Oh, my stomach's tight, I'm, right? That's anxiety. It's like nobody ever taught them that, um, right? Or I feel this, there's something moving up my chest. I feel flushed in my, my face. Like you might be about to cry, right? Mm -hmm. There's sadness coming up. Right. And people really need to learn that and, and get used to it. <laughs> Agreed. And unfortunately, it's just that as men, it's a double whammy. We are taught not to emote yeah. or that it's bad to emote. Yeah. And then the only emotion that's worthy of expression is anger. Right. So how, how do we even begin to re-socialize men to accept that anger is a healthy emotion mm -hmm. uh, as long as it's not tied to aggression. Right. But how do we give men the ability and the freedom to explore the full depth and range of how they might be feeling and even thoughts that may come up that they feel shamed, ashamed about? I think we, we kind of all have to have a conversation with ourselves and with each other. Do we want to hear uh, what else men are feeling besides anger? Mm. You know, because I think some women don't want to hear that either. That's a great point. You know, uh, I think everyone kind of likes the idea of a strong man at times. Yep. And some people get really scared when they see that strong man cry or get shaky. And I think as a society, we have to learn to be okay with that. One of the things that I'd like to touch on is the idea of consent. Mm -hmm. I read an article that men in corporate spaces are avoiding women like the plague. Yeah. They're not having business lunches. They're not comfortable having closed door meetings with women. Yeah. Because somehow they feel like it's, you're running the risk of being falsely accused. Men should really wake up to how much slack we cut them. <laughs> because <laughs> it's like, um, yeah. you know, when we talk about consent, sexual assault, things like that, mm -hmm. we often have a conversation where it's like, well, uh, you know, why didn't she leave? Why didn't she say no? And we're never like, well, why did he do it? You know what I mean? And, and we know most men don't do it. But so I think if you, for starters, like you might want to work as a man on uh, reading your partner. You know, does someone seem uncomfortable? Can you tell if a person is uncomfortable? I think men can. Absolutely. And if you can't, um, you want to examine that. Yep. You know what I mean? That you don't need to avoid someone because you think you're not going to know, you're going to totally misread the situation. Yeah. Let's talk about Louis C.K. for a minute. Sure. Because I know you were back, yeah. started doing shows, and taking a lot of backlash because the idea is that he, ha or the feeling is that he hasn't done the work. Right. What are your thoughts? He kind of came back and seemed to be hoping to just brush it under the rug mm -hmm. um, and that people would just forget about it um, and he wouldn't have to address it. And for someone like him in particular, 
it's, un it's unjust to any time, but for him in particular, where his whole reputation is based on telling the truth mm -hmm. and looking at himself, and oh, here's this big thing that I don't want to look at and don't sure. want to talk about. It kind of makes him seem inauthentic to me. And I was willing to, f to forgive him or to have a new relationship with him sure. um, if he could kind of regain my trust, but he hasn't done that yet. What is your idea or your definition of a good man? You know, I think about that a lot. And I, by way of getting to that, I'll say that a lot of what we think about masculinity is about proving something to other people. And, and that's how we find ourselves in this situation, is like when you prove that you have power, that you're a powerful man, by what you can do to other people or what you can do in the world, I think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So I think a good man today is someone who is self-reflective, who is committed to integrity in his relationships, mm -hmm. um, who can uh, make amends. You know, I think that I think there's real strength in that, and I think that's pointing towards the kind of masculinity I want to see in the future. That when we give men the freedom to be flexible in who they are, yeah. you're strong when you need to be strong, and you can be tender when you need to be tender, and you don't have to just be yeah. this hard shell all the time. I think that's when we're going to see real change in men. Avi, thanks for being here. I appreciate all the gems that you just gave me. My pleasure. For more on this topic, make sure you hit me up on social media and use the hashtag Dear Men. This is a conversation that we have to keep going and have together. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you here next episode. I'm Jason Rosario, and this is Dear Men. <laughs>